All right, why is it taking us so long to get to a Queens of the Stone Age riff? That is a problem we're fixing right now with turning on the screw and it sounds something like this. <laughs> Awesome, awesome riff. It's pretty simple, but also what I think is a really good representation of why Josh Homme is such a beast guitar player from one of what I think is the great bands of all time. Now, what, what we have is really just a dominant seven chord. We're gonna start on the ninth fret of the E string is where we're gonna root the chord, right? And if you have a regular major bar chord, it's just like this, okay? Now, to make a dominant seven chord, you just lift your pinky up. And now if you listen to this episode of Guitar Moves that Josh did, which I will link you to below, it's definitely like pretty fantastic kind of insight into his playing. He kind of talks about how a lot of his playing is made by just subtraction and kind of just playing around. So we're going to talk about what makes it such a cool riff by taking your pinky up, so making this major chord a dominant seven chord, which by itself sounds kind of bluesy, a little, a little dissonance of just turning this note into that note, which is a flat seven from the major scale. Uh, if you don't know, I can link you to a video on just dominant seven chords. But we're not gonna stop, we're not satisfied with the distance of just a dominant seven chord. We're gonna take your pinky and we're gonna add it to the 12th fret on the G string. Okay, and this is gonna be kind of our new chord. And we're gonna go back and forth between this chord and this seven chord, okay? so. The cool thing about uh, Queens of Stone Age is a, a very percussive band. So basically to play the riff, you start off with a couple deadened uh, mutes. Okay, so down up. So if you just do it, it's kind of like three of those mute, and then the kind of pinky action right there. And then the last one is you kind of go on and off and then back on with your pinky. But it's not quite as simple as that. There's a little bit of action going on, a little vibrato going on within this chord. If you just played it like this. That doesn't really kind of capture the essence of what this riff is. It's more like. Right, so there's a little bit of action going on, especially with the pinky. If we just kind of isolate the notes from the 12th fret of the G string to the 10th fret of the G string. Which is kind of what a lot of tabs online will tell you it is, but it's more than that. It's more like. Like the last, uh, the last one, you're kind of getting it bent up. And the reason that it sounds so good within the chord, I mean, it still kind of sounds, you get the essence of it when you do it one note at a time. That kind of bend up to it, which we're gonna talk about in just a second, but really focus on your vibrato. And uh, vibrato is just kind of taking a note, and instead of it just sitting there statically, it's, there's a lot of that going on. In fact, if you, see, if you watch Josh play, he's always kind of adding a little bit of extra action to all his chords, almost, right? In, mo in most songs, anyways. So why this sounds so good in this particular instance is because of what happens when you add your pinky to the G string in this major or dominant seven bar chord shape. Now, if we look at the root note here, it's a C sharp, okay? The, the ninth fret on the E string is a C sharp. So if we go to an octave, there's the next C sharp. And when you put your pinky here, it's causing a lot of dissonance, right? And even more so than that, when you actually kind of add, since we're barring it, the ninth fret on the B string, we get a... Okay, now the reason that there's so much dissonance going on there is because this is actually a, a diminished quality to this chord. Diminished kind of, uh, and what we're talking about now is just like the flat five. So a flat five is when you take the fifth note of any kind of chord. So if we take the major scale, one, two, three, four, five from C sharp, there's a five. The most evil sounding thing we can do to this is flatten that and then add it to the root. Okay, so. The sound of unholiness is a root note and it's flattened fifth. And the cool thing about what he does, instead of going right for the flat five, he's taking the regular five here from a dominant seven chord and adding the octave of it. 
So when you add that to it, it kind of gets like... You still have the instability of a diminished chord, but it's also kind of anchored by the five here. And you get this really cool kind of dissonance that is actually in a weird way resolved by a dominant seven chord, which usually a dominant seven chord is used to build tension to resolve on the one chord. Right? So, uh, anyways, uh, you, you'll learn more about that if you want to like get into the dominant seven chord and the one chord in the dominant seven chord video, but we're really kind of focused on just this. So, when we kind of end this riff, there's that little bend. And again, like I said, a lot of the tabs won't show that bend, but you really kind of want to bend this just a little bit of a half step and kind of choke it real quick. And the reason that sounds so good is because we have this note, which is a G, and then again, the B strings note in this chord is actually a G sharp. So there's that. You can hear the tension between those notes because they're just one note away from each other. It's begging to be bent into unison to be the same note, okay? So it's kind of like just setting up all that tension. And then once you finally get that bend up, it's almost like something has finally gone right in the riff, which again is just a, a kind of like a calling card of the chaos that the Queens of the Stone Age represent in such a cool rock way that isn't exactly metal, but it's still rock. So again, that's why I love this band. So a great example of how this works. So again, we start with the mutes. So that was three times through, and then the fourth time. And then... Now this last part though, is a little bit different every time. So it's almost kind of like a rhythmic fill that he does every time. The way that I was just doing it, I kind of just maybe hit, uh, since I'm on the ninth fret, with the volume up. I'm just kind of hitting maybe like the A and the D string, dragging it back, and then coming back to where we're starting. So if you listen to the song, you know there's a lot of movement kind of going back and forth to kind of create just like a, like a, again, like a chaos in the track. So after every riff, it's a little something different every time. And it's usually just kind of like just picking any, uh, maybe any string, any two strings, just sliding it back and then maybe back forward. Sometimes back twice. Again, there's really not a lot of method to that part. It's just kind of just making some gnarly electric guitar sounds with some pretty rocking distortion on it, okay? So, a lot of the rest of the song kind of covers uh, the same thing, albeit in different places. Same kind of deal, but we're just taking a dominant seven chord, we're altering it by adding the octave of that flat fifth, and then coming back to the seven chord, and then playing it in a really rhythmic, choppy kind of way to kind of make like a really awesome tonal atmosphere. So anyways, like I said, you'll kind of see a lot of this stuff prevalent in uh, the Queens of the Stone Age of songs, which if you haven't checked them out already, you definitely need to, because again, I think one of the great rock bands of all time. And please, if you have any questions or comments, hit me up in the YouTube comment section on Instagram, Twitter, the website, and I'll get back to you guys as soon as I can. Thanks a lot.